And one of the things that we have to understand is we have to understand how monarchies work in order to understand the Bible. And I have a little bit of an advantage being a Canadian. Um, <coughs> and, I, and you know what? I am proud of the Queen. If you, for example, heard her Christmas address, uh, such a beautifully spoken woman. Her English is incredible. And her testimony is wonderful. And what she had to say was very, very much a Christian message. Um, uh, so God is going to make Abram and his family into a great kingdom. And how is he going to do that? Well, it's not clear in chapter 12, but in chapter 15, he does it through a covenant, doesn't he? You see what I'm trying to say? So there it is, kingdom through covenant. What I want, the language is totally different from Genesis 1, where were we talking about image and likeness and all this kind of thing. So the words aren't even the same in Genesis 12, but the idea is identical. God is establishing his rule in the hearts and lives of his people by means of a covenant relationship. And so, that's why the book is called Kingdom Through Covenant, you see, because it's actually what the Bible is saying in each one of these cases. Now, uh, I have another difficult job, and that is, um, let's see, I, uh, we started at half past, so I, I finish at 20 after, right? Uh, we're going to talk about the Mosaic Covenant, and... Uh, this is another double header because uh, there's a chapter that deals with Exodus 19 to 24 and there's a chapter that deals with the book of Deuteronomy. And I probably will say something about both of these, uh, both of these uh, right now. Central to the book of Exodus and indeed to the entire Pentateuch is the covenant made between Yahweh and Israel at Sinai comprised in chapters 19 to 24. The 18 chapters preceding describe the release of Israel from bondage and slavery in Egypt and the journey through the wilderness to Sinai. Chapters 25 to 40 are devoted to the construction of a place of worship as the appropriate recognition of the divine kingship established through the covenant. A much bigger claim, however, can be made for Exodus 19 to 24. This unit is entitled the Book of the Covenant by Moses himself. So uh, if you look at it in Exodus 24, verse 7, uh, the, uh, he calls what he has just written the Book of the Covenant. The Book of the Covenant, along with the Book of Deuteronomy, which is called an addition or a supplement in chapter 29, verse 1, the book of Deuteronomy is, is referred to as an addition to the, to the covenant. This forms the heart of the old covenant, the old covenant. Let's make sure that everyone in the room is on the same page. Do you all know, we talk about Old Testament and New Testament. Do you know what the word testament means? It's the Latin word for covenant. Okay, so we're talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's what Old Testament and New Testament means. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to claim that the interpretation of the relationship of the Old Covenant to the New is the basis of all major divisions among Christians. Okay? How you understand the relationship of the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, to the New Covenant is the basis of all divisions between Christians today. It all comes down to this. So this is really important. Let's look at, let's see if we can look at the literary structure here. When you get to know me, uh, that's, everything begins with a literary structure. Because if you don't understand how the shape of the text, then you don't know how the communication is being made. So the, uh, in chapter 19, 
we have the background. We have the background. I hope you have your Bible open. Don't believe anything I say. Make sure you see it in the text. Okay? Chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words. Does everyone see that? You have a Bible that says that. And God spoke all these words. You may, you may never have heard this before, but the Ten Commandments are not called the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. They are called the Ten Words. Okay? Yes, reference is made in general to the commandments in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But there's no place in the entire Bible that calls them the Ten Commandments. There are two places where, where they're called the Ten Words. Uh, well, th- uh, Exodus 34, 28, Deuteronomy 4, 13, and Deuteronomy 10, verse 4. Um, then I want you to see, uh, well, let me just stop and tell you why there are ten words. Why are there ten words? I'm going to explain this to you. When you read the creation story, the creation of the world is based on ten words. So when you read the creation story, it says, and God said ten times. So God, so the whole world was made by ten words of God. You see that? The, what this means is the world hangs on the Word of God. God spoke and it happened. And the same thing happens for the creation of Israel as a nation. Ten words created Israel as a nation. This is their, this is their constitution, right? Which, uh, which gets reinterpreted by every generation of SCOTUS. This is the Constitution. So just as ten words creates the world, so ten words creates the nation of Israel. So Israel as a nation hangs for her being on the Word of God. That's what's being said. If you look at chapter 21, chapter 21, verse 1, it says... I don't know what your translation says. These are the judgments. Some say these are the ordinances. Some say these are the laws. Some say, what else? Rules? The rules? Okay. Uh, The Hebrew word is really judgments, and it means um, a, a court verdict, like Roe versus Wade. Is, a, is, is the decision that brought about our present uh, uh, abortion laws, right? That's a court verdict. That's a judgment that was made by a court. And so uh, these are the judgments. What these are are specific, um, specific uh, instructions that apply the ten words to various areas of life. Uh, let, let's act, let's, uh, let, 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 me, let me show you. The commandments are absolute commands, usually in the second person singular. They are general injunctions that are not related to a specific social situation. Thou shalt not murder. That means, in, 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 this, in Hebrew... This is low plus the imperfect as opposed to all plus the justice. So it's a general command. Don't do it today. Don't do it tomorrow. Not this week. Not next week. Not this month. Not this year. Not next year. Never. Get the idea? So that's, that's, that's their general prohibitions. And this is what we would call prescriptive law because no fines or punishments are mentioned. As a general rule. 
the ordinances, I just put that up there because it's the, what was in the New American Standard Bible, all right? These are case decisions, case laws, precedents. So when you read these, they sound like Roe versus Wade, okay? The fundam- what we see here is the fundamental principles embodied in the Ten Commandments are applied in particular social contexts. This is what we would call descriptive law as opposed to prescriptive law because it imposes fines and punishments. These laws are usually given as conditional sentences. Conditional sentences are sentences that have if, da-da-da-da, then, da-da-da-da. You all know what we mean? Those are conditional sentences. So, if a bull, uh, a bull gores a person, then this is what you should do. You see? So, they're usually conditional, they're usually conditional sentences. Okay? Let's see, let's go back to see what I was doing here. We have the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. Then we have the judgments or rules or ordinances in 21 to 23. In chapter 24, the covenant is ratified by blood. Let's go and look at that. This is what we would call the covenant ratification ceremony. The covenant ratification ceremony. So this is very much like a wedding where uh, you publicly, solemnly ratify the covenant that you're entering into, okay? And I want you to see some things in this chapter. So let's, let's actually just start here. Verse 20, chapter 24, verse 1, But to Moses he said, Go up to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. What's, act, what's kind of interesting here is at the, at, at the end of chapter 9, Chapter 19 gives you the background to the story, the setting. You know, what happens when you start a big story like Les Miserables or The Count of Monte Cristo? He gives you the setting. Here's the place, here's the time, here's the people that were involved, da-da-da-da-da, right? You set up the story. Then, so it's narrative, it's narrative. Then there's a break in the narrative for the ten words in chapter 20 and for the judgments in 21 to 23. And then in 24.1, he continues the narrative. So if I, I, we don't have time to do this today, but if you were to chop out 20 to 23, you would see that this sentence follows logically on the last sentence of chapter 19. Okay? So the narrative has been split, and in the middle you have the ten words and the, and the judgments. You see what I'm saying? So the narrative is continuing. Verse 2, and Moses alone, but Moses alone will draw near to Yahweh, but they, that is the people, let them not draw, uh, but they, that is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, let them not draw near, and the people will not go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. Did you notice that? The words and the judgments. Did you see that? The words are the words of chapter 20. And the judgments are, the judge, are from chapters 21 to 23. Those are the headings in those two texts. Do you see that? So he told them all the words, that's chapter 20, and he told them all the judgments, that's 21 to 23. And all the people answered with one voice and they said all the words, presumably here, words is a short form for the words and the judgments. This is a common way of doing things in Hebrew because they don't, the Hebrews are not very good at labeling things. So, for example, did I turn this on? Okay. uh, uh, 
They call their Bible, they don't have a word, Bible. They call it the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Or the Law, the Prophet, and the Psalms, because the Psalms is the first big book in the third section of the canon. You see that? That's a lot to say. So if you're out of breath, you just say, instead of saying the Law and the Prophets and the Writings, you say the Law and the Prophets. And sometimes that's too much to say. So you just say the law. And so Paul, when you're reading the New Testament, Paul says, as it says in the law, and then he quotes the book of Psalms. Paul's not stupid. He knows that's the Psalms. But he he doesn't mean, when he says law, he doesn't mean the Torah. He means it's a short form. I'm out of breath for the law and the prophets and the writings. Do you see that? So, this is very typical. The book is the words and the judgments. Here in the second part of the verse, words is a short way of saying words and the judgment. Do you see that? Typical Jewish way of doing things. All right. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh. And I would take that again to be an abbreviation of the words and the judgments. And he arose early in the morning and he built an altar at the base of the mountain and he set up 12 stone pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel and he sent servants of the sons of Israel and they offered up whole burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to Yahweh, namely bulls. When you're offering sacrifices, there are different kinds of sacrifices. You can offer, you can offer uh, turtle doves. You know, you can offer birds. You can offer a lamb, uh, or you can offer a, a, a bull. So obviously, a bull is a, is a very expensive offering, right? So in some places in the world, they would like sacrifice a bull once a year. That's the only time you could get a T-bone. All right. So, th- these, were, th- these were maximum sacrifices. Do you see what I'm trying to say? They're not offering chickens. They're offering bulls. Verse 6, And Moses took half of the blood, and he put it into bowls, and half of the blood he s- tossed or scattered on the altar, and he took the book of the covenant. What's that? Well, that's the book where he wrote the words and the judgments. Do you see that? So the book of the covenant is a book that has chapter 20 to 23 in it. Do you see that? This is the first piece of the Bible that was ever written. The book of the covenant. He took the book of the covenant and he read it in the ears of the people and all the people and, and all and all Uh, Let's see. And they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do and we will obey. And Moses took took the blood and he scattered it on the people. What I would suggest here, what I would suggest is that the altar represents Yahweh and the twelve stones represent Israel. So half of the blood was tossed on the altar and half of the blood was tossed on these twelve stones, not actually put on the people themselves, as a way of saying, of, of, of representing Israel. And what happens is, in between that, is the reading of the words of the covenant. So what I would suggest here is, notice that there's one blood that joins the two parties over the covenant. Verse 8, And Moses took the blood and he scattered it on the people and he said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh cut with you over these words. So, in other words, this book that I've written, chapter 20 to 23, is now the basis of a covenant and there's one blood that joins the two parties. 
we have in verses 9 through, uh, well, 9 through um, 11, we have a, uh, a celebration. I'm going to read this. And Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and twelve of the el- seventy of the elders of Israel uh, went up, and they saw the God of Israel. So uh, somehow God re- represented Himself, so they could see Him. They saw the God of Israel, and under His feet was like the work of lapis lazuli pavement. It was the the color of the sky. It was like the blue of the sky in purity. Do you know what that means? They were flat out on their faces because all they saw were the blue stones under his feet. Just like, just like Isaiah. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Yahweh high and lifted up. What did he see? The hem of his garment. The hem of his garment. Remember that? He says his, the hem of his garment was, was coming out into the hall. You see? That means he was flat on his face and he didn't, couldn't get his eyes any higher. And then it says, uh, but God did not extend his hand against the chiefs of the sons of Israel because in the ancient Near East, you have this idea that if you can see God, you're going to die. Okay? It will will, be experienced. A human just cannot endure seeing the deity. It's going to be the end of your life. You can see, uh, remember remember Manoah, the father of of, uh, Samson, had those experiences, and he says, now I know why you showed me all this, because you're going to put me to death, you see. That's, that's why worship means to fall flat on the, on the ground. It's a death panic reaction from it seeing God, or being in God's presence. God did not extend his hand against them, and they saw the God of Israel, and they ate and they drank. They celebrated with a meal. I want to. T- I would. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're doing all right for time. I, what, what I want to tell you is that this is like, this is like a wedding. This is like a wedding. You celebrate. Uh, what happens in a wedding? Two people who are not related at all now are closer than any other relative. That's what happens when you get married. Someone who isn't your relative is now closer. So it's a legal fiction, you see? Because I can now say this person is closer than anybody who's related to me by blood. So the one blood joins the two parties. We're the same family. You see that? We're the same family. And you celebrate that with a meal. Does anyone know why you celebrate this with a meal? Why, when you get married, now Americans seem to be dropping off the meal, just like a snack. Uh, Why should you have a meal? Why should you sit down and have a meal? That's exactly right. In the ancient Near East, you don't eat with anybody who's not family. And so when I get married... I want to show that this person is now closer than any of my family by eating with her or with him. So this is where Yahweh and Israel get married. And the verb, the verb in the Old Testament for redeem means to do the duty of the closest relative. If you read the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 25, the the closest relative has three duties, well, three or four duties. The first duty is to buy your relative uh, out of debt. 
So supposing I'm having a hard time making a go of things, I take a home equity loan and I lose my house, right? It's the duty of the nearest relative to come and buy back my house, okay? Number two, supposing, supposing, you know, I'm up to my head in manure and it just closes over me and I have to sell my body as a slave. It's the duty of the nearest relative to come and buy me back out of slavery. Thirdly, what happens if I'm killed? Well, of course, it depends on whether the, the killing is accidental or premeditated. If it's accidental, the, 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 the guy can flee to a city of refuge, but it's the duty of the nearest relative to go after him and kill him and avenge that death, okay? These are the duties of the nearest relative. And it's because Yahweh is Israel's closest relative that he buys her out of slavery and brings her out of Egypt. That's the basis for the doctrine of redemption. And what happens is, in the book of Isaiah, you realize that Israel is not in slavery. It's not, it's not only enslaved by Babylon, she's in slavery to sin. And so, Cyrus is the servant that brings her out of Babylon, but the servant of the Lord is the one who brings her out of sin by the sacrifice of himself. So there's where you get the whole doctrine of redemption. It's based on the duty of the nearest relative. And that's why Israel is called my people. I will be their God and they will be my people because they're my relative. They're my family, you see. That's what Yahweh is saying. All right, now we have to uh, quickly, uh, there's a lot that could be said. Uh, I think we'll go to Deuteronomy. Yeah. There's so much that I want to say here. Uh, but I, w uh, but I guess you just have to get the book. Um, so now we're doing Deuteronomy. The heart of the matter and the matter of the heart. And when we come to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, we come to the most important text in the Old Testament. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to impress you. Jesus said that. Okay, so we want to find out how Jesus came to this conclusion. Now, the, the consensus among scholars is that the book of Deuteronomy was given its final form in the 5th century. So, every three years, there's this organization called the Organization for the Study, the International Organization for the Study of the Old Testament. It meets in a different city in Europe every three years, and uh, it met in 2013 in Munich, Germany, and in 2016, it's meeting in Johannesburg in South Africa in September. And uh, I can't go this year because uh, September's a very bad time for me. Uh, but I've been to most of these meetings uh, uh, since 1994. In, uh, in 2013, the president of the old Department of Old Testament Studies at Munich got up and gave us a lecture and basically, he said, what is the Old Testament? It's just, it's just uh, the, the early history of Judaism. That's all it is. And it doesn't go back before the 5th century B.C. So, what do we do with that? This is what, uh, have you ever been in a university? Well, this is what they tell you in the university. I know because I spent 17 years in a secular university. <coughs> That's the problem with these uh, Christian students today. They've never, they've never had their faith challenged. All right, we're going to talk about the date of Deuteronomy. Uh, there's a man by the name of Kenneth Kitchen. 
Uh, and he and Paul Lawrence have put a three-volume set together that's over 1,600 pages. So it's a stack of books this high. And in that stack of books, they have analyzed every covenant, every agreement, every treaty in the ancient Near East in any language possible. So whether it's Egyptian or Hittite or, or Hurrian or Akkadian, uh, Assyrian or Babylonian or whatever it is, or Hebrew, they, it's all analyzed. You can see the original text. You can read it in English. And they show you that these agreements, these treaties, these covenants, all we, they have a literary structure. And in the earliest period, in the third millennium BC, uh, in, the third, in, the, in the late third millennium BC, we have uh, some examples from Syria. Very simple. They have a, a title. They have the stipulations and the curses. In the land of the Hittites, they have a, a, a slightly more complicated uh, structure. Uh, then uh, we have the, in, the early the early second millennium BC, uh, and I lay this out in the book, we have, uh, let's see, where is this? And then f uh, we have the late second millennium BC. I'm going to go there in a minute. And finally, we have the first millennium BC. These are the patterns in the West, and these are the patterns in the East. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to tell you is that, uh, ladies, you know what China is. You're fine China. Your, the style of China changes down through the decades, all right? And if you are really into this, you can pick up a piece of China and date it instantly, okay? We went and visited, we went and visited friends in Scotland, and we went out on the beach. We weren't looking for any kind of junk. We were, this lady that was with us, she picks up glass, colored glass and broken china. That's all she picks up, okay, on the beach. And this is quite a hobby. Uh, they had a conference in the United States for these people, not, not just for beachcombers, people who only pick up colored glass and broken china. You know how many people were at that conference? 15,000. 15,000. Obviously, people are more interested in broken glass in China than they are in the Bible. All right? And so we found, we found some stuff on the beach, and she picked it up, and she said, that's from Leeds in England, 1923. Bang. All right? So the style of China changes down through the decades. Do you get that? The, the, the literary form of the treaties changes down through the centuries. And the book of Deuteronomy has the literary form of a Hittite treaty from the 14th or 13th century B.C., exactly the time in which Moses was supposed to have lived. So I don't know what's wrong with these scholars. They've got their heads in the sand because they're not looking at the evidence. They didn't look there because they didn't believe they didn't believe they already ruled that out. So here is the structure of Deuteronomy. It has a title. It has a historical prologue which gives you the history of the relationship between the two parties. Then there are the stipulations, the stipulations of the covenant. First of all, they rehearse the ten words from the Sinai covenant. And then you have the basic uh, command, which we'll come to. Then we have the detailed commands. And then uh, there's, a, there's instructions about where this text is to be deposited. In the Hittite, when the Hittites made treaties, they made two copies. And each party got a copy and put it in their temple at the foot of the statue of their god. All right? So for many, many years, you know, we've, ha we've known that Moses had two tablets, right? And we've had big discussions. What was on the two tablets? 
was it 1 to 3 and 4 to 10? Was it 1 to 4 and 5 to 10? Was it 1 to 5 and 6 to 10? No. All 10 words were on both tablets because Yahweh's copy and Israel's copy are in the same temple at the foot of the God. What else is the ark but God's footstool? All right? So the, the, the Israelites were doing the same thing that the Hittites were doing in the 14th century B.C. Then we have uh, the witnesses, uh, the witnesses and the blessings and the curses. And the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the covenant in Exodus has a very similar structure. Um, uh, I want to, sh- uh, uh, let's just, let's put everything up here. Uh, so, um, on the left-hand side, you see the structure of the, of the, Hittite, the, late, the Hittite treaties from the, four, the 13th century B.C., the 14th or 13th century B.C. And uh, then you see the structure in Exodus and Deuteronomy. It's exactly the same, with only one difference. In the Hittite treaties, the curses come before the blessings, and in Exodus and Deuteronomy, the blessings come before the curses. This, this order actually comes from the law codes. In the, the law codes, the, blesses, the blessings come before the curses. So in a way, Moses has mixed the treaty form, the Hittite treaty form, with the form of the law codes. What we see on the right-hand side are in our Assyrian treaties from the 7th century BC, the Neo-Assyrian treaties, all right? So this, the president, the president of the International Organization for the Study of the Old Testament wants me to believe that the Old Testament doesn't go back before the 5th century. Why is it that the book of Deuteronomy matches the treaties from the 14th century, but not the ones from the 7th century. Because he's wrong. And he has his head in the sand. He's an armchair archaeologist. All right? Now, when you look, let's go... uh, I don't know what I did with my thing here. Let's go back for a moment. Uh, I've actually... I've actually, am, oh, give me, I don't know which way we're going. Here we go. Okay. When you have a Hittite treaty, and you know what? You don't have to believe me because you could get a book. You could buy a paperback book this size for $20 or less that have all the Hittite treaties in English. You can read them yourself. There's about 35 of them. And you'll see that they have this structure. And, wh- and so what happens when you come to the stipulations is there's two things. First of all, there's what we call, there's a single stipulation that says, you shall be totally devoted and loyal to the great king. Because it's usually uh, an agreement between a great king and a client king, a smaller king, what we call a vassal king, a suzerain and a vassal king, all right? And then you get all the details of what's involved in being loyal to the great king. You know, if somebody, if, if somebody commits an act of treason in my country and he flees to your country, if you want to be loyal to me, you're going to extradite him. You see that? Canada isn't loyal to the United States because if you commit murder and you escape to Canada, we're not going to extradite him. That's why we get your murderers. All right? Don't worry. Justice is always carried out. We, the last, the last uh, capital, uh, the last uh, time that we exacted capital punishment in Canada was 1954. Uh, and since we can't own handguns, our we have armed robberies with sawed-off shotguns. But uh, let me tell you this. Most murders 
in Canada are love triangles. You see that? So uh, if you think you can kill somebody and get away with it, it's not going to happen because the outraged lover is going to come after you. We still have the death penalty in a way. Allah, Allah the, the nearest relative. So, this is how the book of Deuteronomy works. What is the very first commandment? It is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the first commandment. Jesus was right. In the literary structure of the text, it's the first commandment. And it's the greatest commandment. Because everything in chapters 12 to 26 is based on that. Moses actually preaches that for, from chapter 6 to chapter 11. So he gets kind of, you know, riding a horse like some preachers, and he rides that horse for five chapters. But he's basically just saying, here's the greatest command. So somebody was asking, you see, how to, uh, did Jesus, did Jesus, uh, uh, we are following the teaching of Jesus. We've just discovered how Jesus knew that this was the first and the greatest commandment. Once we understand that it's in the form of a Hittite treaty, we can see it is the first commandment and it is the greatest commandment. All right. Now, uh, time is running out and I want to... Uh, here we, we, have law, we have law codes or law treatises from the ancient Near East. Their literary structure is completely different you can see that the, you see the structure of the law codes, the, street, the structure of treaties, and the structure of the old covenant. So, uh, the, the book of Deuteronomy is not in the form of a law code. It's in the form of a treaty. What does this tell us? Let's see, I lost my book here. If I don't have my book, I don't have any thoughts. I'm just teasing. Okay. The significance of the form. The significance of the form. Just as in Exodus 19 to 24, the ten words are foundational to the judgments, here the greatest commandment is the foundation of all the other commandments. One of the things that people have tried to do is they've tried to analyze the law of Moses according to certain categories. So some people say, we'll divide it up into moral laws, civil laws, and ceremonial laws. How many have heard that? Okay. You know what? That's wrong because Moses never uses those categories and they're all jumbled together. You could be reading a moral law and the next verse is a ceremonial law, right? So it's not organized that way. In fact, that's the big problem in the Ten Commandments. You've got a ceremonial law stuffed right in the middle of a bunch of moral laws. So that's why everybody's arguing over the Sabbath. So I'm sorry, folks, but that is not, those are not the Bible's own categories for dealing with this text. Other people say, well, you don't have to obey all those little laws, but you, just have, you still have to obey the Ten Commandments. Okay? Is that going to work? No, that is not going to work because the covenant is a package. The book of the covenant is a package. It's the Ten Words and the Judgments. You can't say, I'll take the judgments, I'll skip the judgments and keep the Ten Words. You don't get that privilege. Moses calls it the book of the covenant. You're either in the covenant or you're out of the covenant. So what the New Testament tells us is that the old covenant is obsolete and passing away. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews. And it's been replaced by the new covenant, which is the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, as we will see in a moment. But I want to make one last claim before we conclude this session. I want you to see a lot of people think of the law of Moses as, as they think of it 
as a law code, as a law code, like our, like the code of laws. You, you don't even know the code of laws I grew up. I grew up in Quebec. Do you know what Quebec does? They, they follow the Napoleonic Code, unlike the rest of Canada. That's where I grew up, following the code of laws set by Napoleon. Quebec, it's almost like a different country. Some people want it to be that way. The law of Moses is not like that. Do you know what it is? It's a covenant. What's a covenant? It's a family relationship, a relationship of love, of loyalty, of trust, of faith, of obedience, of commitment. Do you get that? It's a dad saying to his children. It's a husband saying to his wife, this is how I want you to live. That's totally different from a government saying, this is it or, I pay, or you pay the penalty. Do you, do you understand that? So this is, we have a wrong idea of how the law of, of Moses worked. It was not given... It was not given for salvation because it was given to a group of people who were already redeemed. It was given to show them how to live in the land and have a right relationship with God, how to treat each other in truly just ways and how to be good stewards of the earth's resources so when all the traffic of the world comes through this land, they're going to meet, they're going to meet a group of people who will show, be a light to the nations. All right, let's take a break.